I am truly delighted to be here. But I have to admit, as I look out over all of you, as I look at your faces, my mind is flooded with memories of my own college graduation. I can actually remember every single detail of my graduation. I can remember what I wore, who I sat next to, what the room looked like, what the weather was like. I can remember everything except one thing. I cannot remember who spoke at my college graduation. And I hope after I'm done, the same fate doesn't await me. When I graduated from college in 1966, over 42 years ago, it was a completely different world. At that time, believe it or not, a woman was not expected to have a college education. Now just imagine the world that I grew up in. At that time, a woman's role was simply to be a wife and to have at least 2.2 children. Education for women was not particularly valued. In fact, during my sophomore year, when I got engaged to a very nice man who was studying to be a doctor, my parents suggested that I should quit college. Even though I was an all-A student, they suggested that I should stop my studies and become a laboratory technician so that I could assist my husband, Michael, in his practice. As you can see, as much as I think that's an incredibly good career, I did not follow their advice. And instead, I completed my college education and I received a degree from the School of Speech with a minor in English and Math and a teaching credential from Northwestern University. Again, it was a different world. And at the time that I graduated, the only two careers that were open to a woman were that of a teacher or a nurse. Two wonderful careers, and some of you are going to go into those professions. But even more strange, even though those were the careers that were open to a woman, they really were not thought of as a career that you would do forever. It was really merely an adjunct. You were really passing time until you would get married and become a wife and a mother. And again, though I certainly respect those careers and think they are an extraordinary option to do, it really wasn't what I wanted to do. Because when I was sitting in your seat, I had a secret dream. I wanted to be part of the movies. Ever since I was a child, I used to love to go and watch the double feature at the Hamilton and Jeffrey Theaters. I used to love to get lost in that magical world of the movies. But at the time that I was graduating, telling somebody that you wanted to go into the movie business was like telling somebody that you wanted to go to the moon and we hadn't gone to the moon yet. So I kind of quickly learned to keep my dreams a secret. I was afraid that people were going to laugh at me. I was afraid that they were going to make fun of me. But the dreams and the passion that fueled them simply wouldn't go away. So on the day of my graduation, I kissed my parents goodbye, and I loaded up my car, and I drove to California for the very first time I'd never been out of our state to fulfill my dreams. And as you've heard, I was able to turn my dreams into reality. And I want you to know that the reality is far better than anything that I ever dreamed of. So that brings me to what I'm going to refer to as Lansing's first bit of advice. Even though I chose a career in the movie business, I think this advice that I'm going to give you today, my little list of rules, is applicable for all of the career paths that you have chosen. So before I begin, let me just say that the world is full of lists. And so you've all heard about them. You've heard about David Letterman's top 10, People Magazine's list of beautiful people, Forbes list of the wealthy. So now I'm going to give you Lansing's top 10 pieces of advice, rules to follow after you graduate. Rule number one, follow your dreams. Please don't ever let anyone discourage you. 
Don't ever let anyone tell you that your dreams are silly. And if you have to look back on your life, regret the things that you did, not what you didn't do. Because for me, I think the saddest thing in the world would be not to try to realize your dreams. And so I began that path. I came to Hollywood and I knocked on doors. I used to support myself by being a substitute teacher and yet every day after school, I would get into the car, go into a gas station, change my clothes and try to find a job, any job, any job whatsoever in the movie business. It took me three and a half years to get my first job. And that job was a script reader. I was paid $5 an hour to read scripts for producers so that they didn't have to read them themselves. I would synopsize them. So that brings me to rule number two. Be persistent. When I got my first job as a reader, I had probably been interviewed by over 150 people. Some people actually rejected me more than once. But I have to tell you, I learned to never take it personally. And I actually think that the producer who hired me gave me the job just so he could get me off his back. I think he was so sick and tired of hearing from me that he decided to give me a try. And I was thrilled to get that first job. At the time, I thought if I never had any other job but reading scripts, I was the luckiest person in the world. The fact that somebody was actually paying me to read for them something that I loved seemed too good to be true. I actually never thought about the next step in my career. I was just happy doing what I was doing. So that brings me to Lansing's rule number three. Enjoy the process and the results will come. Whenever I meet students who are graduating, and when, in particular when I used to meet them in the movie business, and they ask for advice, I'd always say to them, well, what do you want to do? And they'd look at me and they'd say, oh, I want to run a studio. And I'd say, well, that's great, but what do you want to do now? They always seem to want to kind of leap over all the steps and yet all of you sitting here today know that that is simply impossible to do. So my advice to you is to enjoy the process. Enjoy the steps along the way and don't worry about the result. Enjoy the journey. And perhaps I can best explain this by telling you a story of about a friend of mine. I had a very good friend and she was a writer. And when she told people that she was writing a book they all sort of got bleary-eyed, they didn't pay any attention to her. But later on, my friend was able to tell them that the book was gonna be published. Wow, they said, you have a book that's gonna be published? Proud of the results, but not of the action. Just getting up to bat is what we should respect. Just trying. So the next six years, I worked within the studio system. I began, as I told you, as a script reader, and then I was promoted to story editor, then executive story editor, then vice president of creative affairs, then senior VP, and finally president of production at 20th Century Fox. By the time that I got that job, I had literally done every job within the studio system. And so my promotion was actually a natural evolution. I had climbed the corporate ladder. Throughout the years, I had worked long, hard days, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I often sacrificed social engagements so that I could do the work. I over-prepared. I overstudied. Which brings me to rule number four. Do the work. There are no shortcuts. Whenever I think about what distinguishes successful people from those who are not, I always think that successful people are people who did the work and who didn't give up, who hung in. But in a funny way, 
If you love what you do, it doesn't seem like work at all. If it's a passion for you, you simply will find that you cannot exist without it. So I'm sure you're all sitting there and saying that I'm making all of this sound much too easy, that I've kind of glossed over my first 10 years in the movie industry, that along the way I must have suffered a lot of disappointments and a lot of setbacks and, you know, just a lot of pain. Well, you're quite right. It was not a bed of roses, and it isn't for anyone. For example, I remember when I was first made vice president, and it was actually one of the happiest days of my life. So naturally, with that a title, I assumed that I was going to get a raise. So I went to my boss, and I asked for one, and he turned me down. He told me that I was earning quite enough money for a woman. I also remember when I wanted to be head of the studio, and I was told by a group of members from the board that a woman could never hold that job. After all, they said, how could you possibly get any man to report to you? Now today, those would be huge class action lawsuits. <laughs> but it was at that time that I learned rule number five. And it's one of the most important ones. Accept responsibility. Accept responsibility for some of your failures. And I learned to do that. I learned that it wasn't just a cruel world. But in fact, I learned that I had to work on my own self-esteem. I began to realize that I had been a passive participant in my setbacks. In fact, I used to accept these rejections without contemplating any constructive action whatsoever. For years, you have to understand, I had been programmed to believe that I actually was worth less money and that I could not hold the number one position. And it was that view of myself that was holding me back as much as the world that I lived in. It took me a very, very long time to think of myself as worthy of deserving more. My self-image needed to grow. I needed to believe in myself before I could ask anyone to believe in me. I actually had to think I deserved a raise before I could get one, and I had to passively not accept being number two and believe that I could run the studio before anyone would give me that opportunity. So I say to all of you, accept responsibility for your actions and your own disappointments. And in doing so, you will take control of your life and you will not be a victim. So now, I was 35 and I was ahead of the studio. There had never been a woman before me and so my appointment was great, graded with a lot of media attention and there were no role models to follow. And in many ways, I was luckier than a lot of you will be since there are now so many role models. Because since there was no one there, I had to make up my own rules. Which brings me to rule number six. Be yourself. Please develop your own style, your own uniqueness, and just be you. Don't copy anybody else. Adopt your own style because if, if you copy someone, all you will do is be a carbon copy of the original and you'll be a poor imitation. So I loved my time as head of the studio, but a lot of you are going to find out that after several years of a corporate structure, it's only natural that you want to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to run my own company and most importantly, I actually wanted to make movies that reflected my own passions and my own sensibilities. And so after four years, I left the safety of the corporate world and I became an independent producer. Which brings me to rule number seven. Change is good. New risks and new challenges keep you alive. Nothing is worse than just repeating yourself. 
You know, I've heard that in many business schools, they tell you that every 10 years, you should replant yourself. So I think that's kind of an interesting thought. In some way, you should grow, you should evolve. And as a producer, we tackled some of the most controversial subjects in our films. We made movies like Fatal Attraction, The Accused, Black Rain, School Ties, and Decent Proposals. Movies that caused, I hope, all of you to talk. They were controversial. They stimulated people and they made you think. Not everybody liked all of our movies, and not all of our movies were successful commercially. But we did films that were dear to our hearts, and in many ways the movies that I made were a Rorschach test for what was going on in my own life, for what I was feeling at the time. Which brings me to rule number eight. Please don't be afraid to fail. Fear of failure leads to mediocrity. I've often thought that people who have the greatest success can also tell you a story about their great failures. But instead of being defeated by their failures, they learn from their mistakes. They paid attention to their mistakes. You know, they often say that good judgment comes with experience, and of course, experience comes with bad judgment. Mistakes are going to happen. They have to. If they don't, you're not trying hard enough. You're just playing it safe. You're not going out of the box. You're being complacent. But the important thing is, a mistake should not be a permanent setback. Instead, you should use it. You should use it to learn from and to grow from. I failed as much as I succeeded. And successful people will often regale you with their stories about being fired. But in all of their cases, they found that that actual act of firing, no matter how painful that failure was, it transformed them and it caused them to grow. At the ripe old age of 46, I met the love of my life, my husband, Billy Friedkin, and I inherited two wonderful children. And I have to say, my husband is right up there, <laughs> and he received an honorary degree today, too. So it's a particularly happy day for us, as it is for all of you. I found that producing was no longer as much fun as it used to be, because I didn't want to be on location away from my family. So I was fortunate enough to be offered the job of chairman of Paramount Pictures. And many people think that I took the job, and perhaps I'm the only person that did, so that I could be home for dinner. Which brings me to rule number nine. And this is the rule that a lot of you are going to disagree with. And perhaps it's my most controversial, and maybe it just applies to me. You cannot do it all. Or maybe I should say, you cannot do it all at the same time. You can do it sequentially. I had been a working woman, single without children, until the age of 46. I had to prioritize my life. And perhaps it's best illustrated again by a story. When I was about 14 years of age, I was watching a talk show with Dick Cavett, and it's pretty much like what John Stewart is today. And he was interviewing a very, very famous actress, the Julia Roberts of her time, Katherine Hepburn. And he said, Miss Hepburn, you have the most extraordinary career. You've won every single Academy Award. You've been feted everywhere. She said, thank you. He said, but you're not married. And she said, that's correct. She, he said, don't you regret that? She said, no. She said, but you don't have any children. Don't you regret that? She said, no. He said, but she said, I simply couldn't do it all. Because she felt that she would be pulled different places. Now, I admire anyone who can do it all, and I admire people who do it all sequentially. Today, I am incredibly grateful for my life. I love my family, I love my stepchildren, I love my friends, and I love my work. But I did it sequentially and I feel truly blessed. 
truly blessed. Which brings me to my final rule, rule number 10. Don't forget the F word, fun. I just wanted to see if you were paying attention. <laughs> Please try to have fun every day. Without fun, none of this will make any sense. It's an important component of your life, and humor and fun can get you through almost anything. And as most of you know, I have applied that rule of change. And once again, as you heard in my introduction, I've entered a new phase of my life. I left the movie business four years ago. At 60 years of age, and I do believe that 60 is the new 50, or maybe it's just the new 60, I decided that I wanted to leave the movie business and I wanted to try something else. The joy of running a studio for over 12 years was getting less and less. The highs weren't as high and the lows weren't as low. For me, it all had a repetitive quality. In fact, I had accomplished all of my goals and I was simply repeating myself. Someone once said to me that you should think of your life as a book. And if you did, what would you want this chapter to be about? And I just didn't want to die at my desk. I had been incredibly blessed and continue to be in my life, and I felt a great need to give back to society. And so as you've heard, I formed my own foundation dedicated to cancer research and education. So I'm joining all of you in your work. But for me, I feel like I'm a graduate because every day is filled with newness and joy. I'm working on new projects that I care desperately about, and you too, I know, are gonna feel as if you're making an incredible difference. You will, as I am, be working on things that are bigger than yourself. My world is expanding, and I'm meeting new people, traveling to new places, learning new things. I feel as young as you. I feel more alive and more authentic than I've ever been before. It's really the happiest time of my life. I get to control my days, and that means I get to come here to Penn State, to this wonderful school, and I get to speak to all of you. So in closing, I just wanna first thank you for listening to me and tell you what you already know, that the world is a far different world than when I graduated. Remarkable progress has been made. You all have unlimited possibilities. You have unlimited options. And if you take nothing else from what I said today, just know that each and every one of you can achieve anything that you want, any dream that you might have. You are all unique individuals who can and will make up your own list of rules. And in doing so, you will change the world. Good luck and congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.